Hello, I'm George Wick, the Amateur Logician from AmateurLogician.com, and today I want to preview with you all a pretty good introductory logic textbook. It's by David Kelly and Debbie Hutchins. It's The Art of Reasoning, an Introduction to Logic, 5th edition. Usually I order a textbook used rather than new, but this was an exception to the rule. Now, if you want to self-study material that you'll find in the average university course on introductory logic, then you really can't go wrong with this textbook. It's a very clean, clear, and concise textbook. Perhaps it's only because I haven't seen the latest editions of other logic textbooks of a similar kind, but I want to point out a really unique feature of this textbook. If we open the textbook up and turn to the table of contents, you will see that an entire chapter, namely chapter four, is dedicated to cognitive bias. And that's really, really a good addition to any study of introductory logic, because if we're thinking about argumentation in general, one thing that could easily get in the way of good logical reasoning is definitely our emotions and psychological tendencies. For example, the textbook talks about confirmation bias, that is, seeking out what supports our present beliefs and simply ignoring other beliefs, ignoring other arguments. And very much related to that, there's belief bias, that is, we have a conclusion we believe in, and then let that influence how we evaluate any given argument for that conclusion. However, just because a conclusion might in fact be true, it doesn't mean a particular argument that argues for that conclusion is valid or sound. It might be a very bad argument indeed. The textbook furthermore covers hindsight bias, heuristic biases that concern, for example, the availability of data, there's also attribution biases, and so forth. It's not a perfect chapter when I was reading it. There are a few things that I didn't like about it, to be honest, but still, I think the general idea is very good. So 4.1 is on confirmation bias and bias sources. Then we have other general biases, heuristic biases, self-defensive biases, and very importantly, section 4.5 is on countering bias. So if we have a general idea of what the kind of biases are, we can then self-reflect on our own argumentation and the argumentation of others to hopefully be a little bit more objective when thinking about arguments so that we don't engage in these biases, which we all have some predisposition to engage in to some degree. Now, it is a standard textbook, so it covers the standard material that you find in the average university course, so there's propositional logic, predicate logic, there's some induction. If we open it up, like a lot of contemporary textbooks, you'll see nice little outlines of major facts. So here we have the common fallacies and counter biases. We have a list of the fallacies and their definitions. We have the counter biases. We have a little information on categorical propositions, which is kind of a simplified version of Aristotelian classic logic. We have the four standard forms, the AIEO propositions. So the A proposition, for example, all S are P, the universal affirmative proposition, the O proposition, some S are not P. So that's a particular negative proposition. We have the traditional square of opposition. So A and O relate to each other as contradictories. If one is true, for example, the other one is necessarily false. If one is false and necessarily, the other one is true. We have a little section on immediate inference here. So conversion, aversion, contraposition. And if we flip over the book, we'll see some information on propositional logic, the implication goals, such as modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogisms, and so forth. We have the replacement rules. They're basically logical equivalencies. We have predicate logic, replacement rules, implication rules, we have a little chart here about the common logical notation. Kind of interesting to think about because if you pick up the average logic textbook in a philosophy department, you'll see the horseshoe used for the if-then conditional. But if you pick up a mathematical textbook, you will more often see the arrow. I personally prefer the arrow, but be that as it may. Likewise, here they use the dot for and. Other textbooks might use the ampersand, or my preference is the wedge. But that's just a matter of convention. Different textbooks 
have their own approaches in that regard. And as I said, this is a new textbook, so apparently I have access to the ebook and also I think an interactive interface where I can practice some problems. So hopefully in a future video, I'll show you that and we'll work through some problems together. Let's go back to the table of contents. But actually, let me show you a kind of a cool quote from Thomas Jefferson. So this definitely influences the title of the book. So here it says, Jefferson said, in a Republican nation whose citizens are to be led by reason and persuasion and not by force, the art of reasoning becomes of first importance. So we see the connection there, of course, with the title, The Art of Reason. That's pretty interesting. A good quote from Thomas Jefferson. So here is your basic um, coverage of topics. So part one, we have language and reasoning. Chapter one is on language concepts and propositions. Then we go into argument analysis, fallacies, and content biases. Part two is on deductive logic. We have categorical propositions, categorical syllogisms, reasoning with syllogisms, propositional logic, natural deduction and propositional logic, and predicate logic. And then finally, we have part three. We have generalization and causality, analogical legal and moral reasoning, statistical reasoning, probability, and explanation and science. I think it's the rear semester course that actually gets into probability theory. There may be some statistics, but um, these last chapters, generally speaking, are really covered in the semester course, but they're good to know. And obviously, the statistics here and the probability here are pretty basic. It's not too advanced. But at the same time, because it is basic, it's stuff that everyone should learn. Everyone should know the basics of statistics. Everyone should know the basics of probability. As I said, it's a very clean, clear, and concise textbook. There are some sidebars, but they're not too many. They're not too distractive. You do have exercises in the textbook, and at the end of the textbook, you will find some answers, so you can check your work. Let me skip ahead. So here I thought was a pretty cool analogy. So this is section 9.1, Natural Deduction and the Rules of Inference. So let's say you are solving a maze, What's one good strategy to solve it? Well, you start at the end and work your way back to the start. Excuse me. And likewise, if you're doing a proof in propositional logic or predicate logic, often it's a good idea to start with the conclusion and work your way backwards. So here we have more stuff on propositional logic. So for example, P and Q is the same thing as Q and P. Or you can replace P and Q with Q and P because they're logically equivalent. Association um, is another property. You have double negation, things like that. Distribution. So this is very algebraic. So in algebra, you have a distributive property. In algebra, you have an associativity, commutative property. Here we're getting into predicate logic, so with identity, we start using that. We have inductive logic, so analogies and ethics. Skipping ahead, here we have some basic probability theory. So overall, I think it's a pretty good textbook. It's by no means perfect, but um, I think you couldn't go wrong with it be hard to find another book that's better than it in terms of what's covered in the average university course on logic. For what is worth, a favorite philosopher of mine, Edward Fazer, I believe, assigns this textbook when he teaches logic at his college. That's not necessarily a wholehearted endorsement of the book, but it shows that at least he thinks it's of some value, and it is, it is of some value. But in any case, if you're interested in purchasing this book, look at the description of the video, and I have some links. I'm the Amateur Logician. You can visit my website at amateurlogician.com where I have a lot of resources on logic and other things. And I hope to see you soon.